in a minute or two, Late Levy will pop up on your screens, which tells you that this is going to be a track and field segment. And Jamaica has produced its eighth member of the 10-8 club after Natasha Morrison sped to a 10.87 second clocking to win the women's 100 meters at Tropical Park in Miami, Florida on Saturday. The 28-year-old now owns the second fastest time in the world this year behind Shakari Richardson's 10.72 set in Miramar, Florida two weeks earlier. The Stephen Francis coach Morrison had also clocked 10.98 in the heats before Saturday's lifetime best effort. Her previous personal best was 10.96 set on her way to a seventh place finish at the 2015 World Championship that of course was staged in Beijing. This is how Morrison stacks up on the Jamaican all-time list. She has moved from joint 12th to 8th spot. Some illustrious figures ahead of her, including the last two Olympic champions, Shelly Ann Fraser-Price and Elaine thompson era tied at the top at 1070. Ottie Stewart, Campbell Brown, Sharon Simpson, Julia Cuthbert also there. So we are joined by senior writer at Sportsmax.tv, Leighton Levy, to discuss Morrison's performance. Um, uh, Leighton, welcome to the Sportsmax zone. Awesome run there by Natasha and uh, easily her most imposing effort so far in her career. Yes, and, and the, the thing that impressed me most about the, the run on Saturday, Lance, was that in the semifinal, she ran, in the preliminary, she ran 10.98, which tells you that this was not a fluke. So she comes back in the final, executes a better race and runs 10.87. And of course, we saw the Pantheon, which she now joins. It's been coming for a long time, I think, for Natasha Morrison, because I think, as, as you mentioned earlier, 10.96 in 2015, many believe that from that point onwards, she would have then gone on to join the likes of Shelley and Fraser Price and Lillian Thompson as among the elite of the elite Jamaican sprinters, and there are many. But she's injury issues, changing clubs from MVP, going over to Sprint Tech, and then coming back. Um, you now I think she's beginning to really fulfill the potential that she's shown ever since she was in high school. Yeah. How long has this latest stint with the MVP track club been? I think it's just a season ago. I think she was at Sprint Tech up until the end of 2019. Um, it's, 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 it's about a season that she's back. Um, she had left MVP shortly after 2015 for reasons that were never made clear. Um, what the, the, I, I was having a discussion with uh, some of the principals at MVP, and they believe that her going to Sprint Tech was perhaps the best thing after leaving MVP because she was able to maintain a certain level of consistency. And now coming back at MVP with their familiarity with her physiology, they were able to get these results quickly. And they're, in fact, expect, expect her to run a lot faster as the season progresses. So it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what times she's able to deliver once she remains healthy. Yeah, and uh, Stephen Francis's work with the, the women in sprints is, is really well documented. So you have to think that she's in good hands. She is. And uh, I think her immediate um, coach right now is Paul Francis. I think Stephen Francis works with the... The Nike athletes in the club, I think uh, Natasha is either on Natasha or she's with Puma. I don't remember exactly right now. But the, the, the coaching methodologies and the technology available at MVP certainly helps those athletes who have the potential to break out. And she's clearly now one of them. At 28, she's in her prime. So perhaps this is actually the best time for her. She can run for a good two to three years at this level. And she will most likely be a medal contender in, in, pre in championships to come. Uh, Leighton, I, I, I want to suggest here that the 2020 season, as it turned out to be because of COVID-19, was pretty much an off-season for most of the world's athletes. And uh, can it be that in, you know, a, a, a twist of, of, of events, that that sort of break has actually turned out helping some of the athletes? In, in several ways, I think. I think from, for those who might suffer injuries, it gives them a chance to heal. But also, I think the, the, the extended training periods have helped the athletes get stronger, more resilient, you know, building up speed endurance and strength endurance. And I think we're beginning to see it manifest in a number of ways. When you look at the times and the performances right across the world, not just in Jamaica, you see athletes performing at, at a very high level, primarily because of that extra time spent in training. Because as you know, each season, is a race against time to get fit for major championships or the Diamond League. There are injuries that come to bear, athletes have to sit out for a while 
and then invariably they come back maybe half baked, so to speak. Well, now that they've had an extra year to prepare, what I think you're seeing is though the extra work now beginning to pay off for a lot of these athletes. Uh, not much time to go late, and I want to squeeze in two quick things. One, for those athletes who race over time, over their career, they've gone close to their personal best, which is very fast. So they, 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 they know what it is to get into that neck of the woods. Versus an athlete who is on the up, was on the up before COVID came. COVID came, robbed them of races, so they aren't quite, they aren't quite tuned as the other athletes are. I want to look at advantages and disadvantages. So let me put it starkly. An athlete like Shelly and Fraser Price or Elaine thompson Hera, who are used to running fast times and can run certain times with their eyes closed, as opposed to another progressive athlete who, with a normal course of events, would have progressed to an area where they too was running fast times, but who has not got to, gotten a chance to do that because of the disrupt, this, this disruption. Is there any difference between what a Shelly and Fraser Price and then Elaine thompson Hera will be able to produce just like that? as opposed to another athlete like a Natasha Morrison, who has just now found a new high water mark? Good question, George. But I think the answer is not as simple as... It can't be as simple. Through. That's why I'm asking yeah. you. <laughs> I know, because I think it all depends on the athlete's cycle, the athlete's physiology. Because, you know, training programs, athletes respond to, to the same training program in different ways. So for what might work for one athlete doesn't necessarily work for another. Like, let's take Javon Francis, for example. When he was at Calabar, you saw where he needed races to get sharp. And the more races he ran, the faster he would run. That's the usual of the consensus among coaches, that you need five to seven races to, to, to get to your sharpest. Then we see an athlete like Shakaria Richardson, for example, who comes in and opens with 10.72. I think Natasha Morrison falls somewhere in between. She's had a number of races this season, varying between 11.1 and 11.4. So that kind of consistency within that time frame would have suggested that she's aiming to run a faster time. That she dropped three tenths of a second from her from 11.41 that she ran the week before is not really surprising given the consistency that we've seen from her over the past few weeks. Yeah. So the short answer is it depends on the athlete, it depends on the program and how they respond to the program that they're on. Last one, and we don't have enough time. I get the sense that some people from this part of the world in the Caribbean, not just Jamaica, believe that our athletes here are undercooked relative to athletes in North America and even in Europe. You know these things. Are they right to be worried going into the Olympics that that is the case? Not really. I think one of the things that I think a lot of athletes benefit from, for example, in first world countries, George, is better nutrition programs and better support systems. In the Caribbean, that's not always necessarily the case. So what is happens, you'll find an athlete will probably join a program and they're deficient, deficient in all kinds of different nutrients. Their muscles are not properly developed for one reason or the other because they lack certain, certain nutritional um, you know, elements, nutrients. And then they fall into a system where then they get that support. And then eventually they start to bring forth their, their full potential. What you see from first world countries is that because of the support that they get from sponsors and from their, um, their organizations, their governing bodies, they are able to then perform at a higher level more consistently because their bodies are better ready for that training that they're, they're, they're going to be undertaking to get ready. So it, 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 the, the, from the Caribbean, a, a lot of it has to do with, with resources and finances. In the first world countries, it has more to do with physiology and coaching, but invariably it comes back down to proper nutrition and a proper development program coming up as an athlete. Okay, thanks, Leighton. Uh, great having you as usual on the Sports Max Zone. Okay. As usual, guys. Oh, well, uh, hold on. We, we still have one more thing on track and field to talk to you about because uh, the World Athletics uh, announced the schedule for the 2022 World Championship in Eugene, Oregon. The schedule accommodates athletes wanting to contest any of the traditional doubles, 100, 200, 200, 400, 800, 15, 15, 5,000, as well as 5,000 and 10,000 meters. Now, this means that the likes of a Bahamian superstar, Shoney Miller Weibo, does not have to choose between the 200 and 400 meters, given she will not be required to do uh, the two disciplines in any one day of uh, competition. Um, your reaction to that news, Leighton? I think what this shows is that the IOC is actually working to kill the sport, while there are some people among track and field, the World Athletics, who are trying to help the sport. Because I'm sure everybody watching for the Olympic Games would love to see Shawnee Miller go up against uh, Salva Adnasir if she escapes the escapes a ban from the um, from, from the 
Code of Arbitrary for, for Sport. And we'd love to see her clash against the like of Ashakari Richardson and a, a Daphne Skippers and Elaine Thompson going 200. With at the Olympics, that doesn't happen. But what we see here from the, the World Championships in 2012, that we'll be able to see all of this and more and brings more excitement to the sport. And I think it's a kudos to the organizers for scheduling the, the meets like this because it shows that it can be done. And if they did it for Michael Johnson and Barbara Bisco Hooks, there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to do it for, for Shawnee Miller, who's probably the best um, double sprint, um, combination sprint of the modern era. But this is an example of what is possible. And I think the athletes will be very happy for it. You're so right. Leighton Levy, thanks for joining us again on the Sportsmax Zone. We go to break and we return with our final segment on the show for today.